feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a special episode of The Shrimp Tank. I'm your co-host, Ted Jenkin, with my co-host, Lee Heisman. Of course, we interview some of the brightest and best CEOs and entrepreneurs in and around all of the major cities in the United States. Uh, today, so many people want to become an entrepreneur, but how do you learn that? Do you get an MBA in entrepreneurship? You can, but the best way to learn is to talk to other CEOs and entrepreneurs that have done it. We're very excited today to have on David Jemmett. He is the CEO of Cerberus Sentinel. Uh, when I saw, Lee, when I saw their slogan, if you will, that cybersecurity is a culture, not a product, I think there probably couldn't have been a more opportune time to interview David today because I think that really encapsulates what's happening today in America, that uh, you know whether or not you're a person sitting in your house and you just have a few PCs in your house or you've got a company of thousands of employees today, the question is, are you more susceptible to a physical attack or are you more susceptible to a cyber attack? And uh, we're seeing that uh, happen every single day. So David, thanks so much for uh, joining us today, for hopping into the tank with us. Of course, uh, folks, you can always get a replay of all of our broadcasts at shrimptankpodcast.com. You can download us at Apple Podcasts, Google, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or anywhere on the internet. And uh, this video will be up on our YouTube channel. We're excited to say that we keep crushing the downloads on this podcast every single week. And I think it's because people want to hear from entrepreneurs and CEOs like, uh, like David. Um, so we're excited to talk to you. Tell us a little bit right now about what's happening in cybersecurity and what you're seeing with companies across America who are trying to implement policies to stop these uh, threatening attacks that they get every day. Well, thank you, Lee and Ted, for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, well, it would be it would be a little surprising to you that a lot of folks are not addressing it. Um, it's still a budding, even though you hear cyber everywhere, uh, really since the pandemic, that's really brought it to the surface. But a lot of people are still, believe it or not, don't want to know what they don't know because they're going to have to fix it, which costs money. Um, but it is, a, it is a landscape that if you're in cybersecurity, it is an actual concern that people should be aware of. And I think training and understanding what really happens. Is yeah, reasonable. David, I, I know because Lee and I both, uh, you know, own companies, we've sold companies ourselves. And when you talk about this concept of it being a culture, am I mistaken in thinking that this whole concept of, of phishing is, is maybe the number one things that happens at companies today, that there are people that impersonate the CEO of the company, asking them to buy gift cards, or they send an email that tries to get you to click on something that you shouldn't click on. And is there training today to get companies better at this so they can, they can basically install this as part of their culture? Absolutely. There are several training companies out there. Um, the one we use and we partner with is No Before. And they actually do fishing expeditions. Uh, Stu's company and Kevin Mitnick, they just sold actually. Um, mm. But they really specialize in helping people understand what the issues are, real life scenarios. And they run fishing expert, exp, um, expeditions. So if you click on it, it'll take you to a page and go, whoop, you shouldn't have done that. In fact, every 11 seconds, someone is being targeted or hacked. So that's, that's a pretty serious number and what is the biggest link weakest link inside a company is the people not being prepared or understand and clicking that button so true and you know i want to clarify for listeners out there when david or ted speaks of a fishing expedition this is not off the coast of florida or california <laughs> with the letter f it's with the letters ph and you can do a little research on your own to find out exactly what david's speaking about but that's more of a cyber direction. I wanted to be clear, David, as you, you know, we have our listeners, like you said, David, although it's a very popular hot topic, most people don't address that. And I would like to find out in your experience, what aspect of cybersecurity do organizations struggle with the most? I think understanding that um, a lot of, uh, this is my seventh company, but I've dealt with a lot of C-levels, Fortune 5000, Fortune 500. And it's interesting the reason we trademark cybersecurity as a culture, not a product, because it's from the top down. 
and they don't understand it, it becomes a black hole. And so how can you address something you're not understanding? How can you put that trickle down effect to the, everyone else? Um, and just to kind of elaborate a little more, fishing essentially is like fishing in the Atlantic or the Pacific because hackers throw out lines and they don't know if they're going to get a little fish or a big fish. They're looking for the whale. I like that. Yeah. That's very, very true. Sorry, Ted. I, I was going to ask, you know, we, we have a lot of small to medium sized business owners that listen to our podcast and they're growing their businesses. And I feel like IT services in general is something a lot of them neglect. You know, they get five employees, David, they get 10 employees. Where, where's the best place for them to start with all of this? You know, if they don't have a policy in place today, they know nothing about how to protect their company's IP or all their information or what's in the cloud. Where, where, do, where, do, where should someone start with this that has, you know, 10, 20 employees? Candidly, find a trusted advisor. There's a lot of folks who and I want to make a differentiate. So IT is different than cybersecurity. IT mm. put systems together and they try to secure it after they design it. We think like hackers. So we always say this security by design. They really should start any kind of application or implementation services by understanding how to secure it first. A lot of people don't understand it. So it pays to go get someone to help them through that process, but make sure they're professionals because I always use the analogy. If you get in a car accident and go to the emergency room, do you want a dermatologist or a general practitioner working on you or a new person out of college? Or do you want someone who's got 12 years, 15 years of experience? That's exactly right. No, I, I can't echo that enough. You're exactly right. Find the professional. You promote that through entrepreneurship, David, that you know, you, you make your widget and you surround yourself with the other experts that make yours or make theirs. But there's something that I read about your firm, what I found to be very impressive is your firm is technology agnostic. Can you speak to that? Because that seems to be a theme of your organization. It's a very important theme. When I started the organization, um, some of these C-levels I can't talk about, some of the companies, they would call and go, they were friends. And they'd say, hey, I need you to help me. And I hadn't even started the company yet. And I said, okay, play, well, let's play golf and then go to dinner and tomorrow I'll come check it out. And they would show me a $1.5 billion <laughs> line item that says cybersecurity. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm one guy, but I, we have to dig into it. So the issue is, is understanding cyber and how it works. A lot of people... Think about any product in cyber right now. You can think of five or six. They lead with that product. Most of the time, they have someone else install it or they install it without looking holistically at what else they're, what else they're using. So they may have firewalls. They may have uh, you know, um, a SIM or an MDR, products that help track anomaly, but they're not working together. And so what we found is we go in and look at the products they currently have. We make them work together. And then if there's a missing piece, we'll say, here's three products that you can look at. Here's the pros and cons. And it'll help you become more secure. And they're really tired of just buying products and have them installed. And in fact, we've seen some products installed from just the basics and they didn't install it to curtail to the company's needs. That was a fortune by our company, which was a little shocking. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And for folks, if you want to check out the ticker symbol, it's CISO, which is just, uh, it's brilliant, by the way. And uh, it seemed to be a hot topic now, David, about Elon Musk, you know, buying Twitter. And, uh, you know, this whole notion about whether um, somebody is verified, meaning that, you know, they're going to, I guess, get a gold check or a gray check or a blue check, whatever that's going to mean in the end. Um, but people get worried that, you know, there are bots that are hacking out there. Uh, what, what does that even mean to the average business owner or consumer when they hear this idea that there are bots attacking you? It sounds like so, you know, Space Odyssey 2000 for people. It, it's actually real. 30 to 40 percent is estimated the traffic on the network, which is a lot of traffic, are bots. Um, <clears throat> they're looking for information. Have you ever noticed Amazon, when you say something around an Alexa, the next thing is, is on your browser, right? <laughs> You've had that happen. Okay. So 
hackers have become smarter. They're very educated. Mm-hmm. They spend 24 hours a day working in groups to perfect things to make it easier for them to get into. So what they do is, we'll use the fish analogy, they throw a net out with these bots, just think of nanobots, and they go out and search and ping all the information. Sure. And they, they come back, these bots send information back, go, here's an easy target. Here's an easy target. And so most of the work's done, now they just have to go in and exploit it. And so that's what the bots are out there for. It's marketing, <clears> it's you know, gathering data, but a lot of it is hackers seeing how they can exploit companies as well as individuals. So here, here's what's um, fascinating to me. And you, know, you grow a company like yours, it's a highly technical uh, topic of cybersecurity and you have to go find talent. And as we know, talent is in short supply today. It's not easy to find talent, but I'm wondering because there are a lot of owners that listen to the show that have technical businesses. How do you, how do you hunt for talent in the whole cybersecurity space? And then how do you know whether you have somebody that knows what they're talking about with cybersecurity to begin with? Do they, do they sit down and take a hacker test or something like that? Well, we are very unusual in our business and I'm afraid to even talk about it because you have such a large audience. There is 4 million job openings today in cyber. It has been zero jobless rates since 2011. Wow. Gardner Forrester says by 2025, there will be 12 million openings. I actually, when I need something, I call my friend of me who is a competitor <laughs> and we jointly work together to solve problems. So you can't hire one or two. And to actually give you a really good example, one of the executives at Microsoft called me because I've known him forever. Hey, Dave, we just solved our cyber. We had a couple thousand recs open. We just solved it. You've got a great business. I said, how do you do that? You buy companies. We go through 25, 30 companies before we find somebody that's who fits our culture and also is really bright and knows what they're doing before we actually bring them into the fold. We have publicly, we have acquired 16 companies around the globe in the last 18 months, two years. Wow. That's where you find the talent because again, Mm -hmm. do you want some kid coming out of college and there's a hack? You need to know how to investigate it, document it, save the information, chain of custody, so that you can prosecute or find it out. Most IT folks, we need them. There's a shortage, but they turn the machine off and turn it on. And there goes all the logs of everything that took place. And it cuts off the information. So that bot or that program says, I can't talk. It starts encrypting all the machines. So it needs to very, you need to handle those things very, 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 very carefully. But Mm. training teaching the people the right training methods. Uh, If you're monitoring networks, you need to know what to look for. So we have gone out around the country and we typically look at 30 companies before we actually find one we want. We may or may not buy it or merge with us. And so what we've done is gone around the globe, found those companies, and that's the whole reason we went public the way we did is it's self-funded. We actually have them private private chips. We basically say, you turn your private chips in to be public, but we want you to come with it. And then we give everyone who's worked with them before options in the company. 99.2% of this company is owned by the people in it. You know, so I love that you said frenemy. And for, for entrepreneurs, owners out there, David, you've cornered the market with that. Ted, I'm listening to David. And instead of him trying to investigate and interrogate all these new employees for credibility, you're simply procuring them from purchasing quality companies so you know you have a qualified staff. And in this high level of cybersecurity, that seems to be the smartest way. That's very, I tip my hat to you, that's a very smart way to go about it. But cybersecurity, David, is changing. You know, I would say every week, every month, there's probably every couple seconds or something changing with it. You're a leader on on the planet in cybersecurity. People are turning to you. How exactly do you stay ahead of the curve? How can you stay with the ever-changing environment that you're in? Well, um, everybody outside may find this, you know, not a good thing to say, but 
we're geeks and nerds and we're proud of it. <laughs> the company is run by geeks and nerds. Everyone here understands it. And so we keep involved learning. We learn ourselves every day. So people go, oh, I went to dark net. Well, you can't get there from your regular browser. You have to be invited. So we have some of the top talent going in and researching the new techniques being used so we can actually combat that and help our clients. David, let me interrupt and say something. And I've said this for years in the world of technology and you said it best. Uh, when I have open heart surgery, I don't want my cardiac surgeon to be the friendliest, most personable person. I'd like him to be the geek and the nerd that knows exactly what he's doing when he's performing open heart surgery. So yours is the type of firm where I say stand proud as the geeks and nerds because you're the ones that are doing the heavy lifting on the front end. Yeah. And just to finish what I said, Microsoft put, and if you look it up, put Mandian under contract, but not exclusivity for $3.7 billion. Google had the same problem, so they bought them for 5.2 million the next Tuesday in exclusivity. <laughs> they solved the problem because they can't hire one and two. You know, one of the things that, that's interesting in here, and I'm wondering if you're able to talk about this being a publicly traded company, but I think, it, you know, obviously you've been involved with private companies as well, is that there's always this term for entrepreneurs that, that growth sucks cash. And, and uh, when you look at, at the revenues of the company, y'all have done an amazing job. You know, you see tripling the numbers and even as they get bigger, the numbers are doubling every year. What's the biggest challenges you face as a, as a CEO as those revenues skyrocket and you hit that hockey stick? And, and what kind of advice would you give an entrepreneur who might be on a smaller level about, you know, how to prepare for, for growth? Well, there's a couple of different avenues, but this is my seventh organization. This is self-funded all the way through. We had no banks, no PE firms. Wow. Because we wanted to make sure that a businessman didn't run this or a board run it from a PE standpoint of you have to be profitable. We, buy, we brought companies in that are profitable. So it makes us profitable, gives us a customer base. We get the people and we can cross pollinate, like a training company can now use our pens testing services or our SOC services. So our biggest organic growth is internal uh, of our clients, which I'm proud to say, I've done rollups before, this isn't a rollup. 98% retention on clients, which is surprising. Wow. And that's because of the good people who take care of the clients for what they need. So David, real quick question for you before we get to our plead the fifth section. You know, being the entrepreneur that you are owning and starting many businesses, what's what was the biggest differentiator for, for listeners out there that have never gone public, which the majority have not gone public? What, what is the biggest differentiator that you found the biggest challenge from owning your own businesses to suddenly going to a publicly traded company? Paperwork. <laughs> this team makes up a lot of paperwork. And most companies. So when we file a 10Q every quarter to show our numbers, it's already stale because we've acquired three or four more companies. So that's the banks are behind where we're really at and that's okay, they'll catch up. But going public, you have to be spot on with people you trust from an accounting standpoint to keep current with the SEC. If you're profitable and making money, keep it private. The reason we took it public is because the PE and VCs who are doing the same thing we're doing but paying cash the people inside the company only have A, B, C, D units. But what does that mean? When we give options, they actually have a meaning and they can watch it appreciate as they grow the company. So that's why we went public is to make sure that we kept everybody because everybody's a shareholder. And more importantly, they get to see their growth with the company and they work hard to make that keep going up and doing the best they can. That's the differentiator. But entrepreneurs, keep it. try to keep it internally. If you do go get money, make sure it's friendly money because they're there to make money on your money, on your back. And there, there are companies who have amazing ideas who need that capital to grow fast. But if you can do it on your own, do it on your own. Otherwise, find a reputable group to give you capital who will feed you the money you need and do it in a friendly way. 
Well, it'd be fun here to do a uh, a little um, a little rapid fire. I think it'd be be interesting. Uh, not always the CEO you get on the rapid fire here. Uh, it's usually the other way oh. around. Uh, but you know, you've done seven different companies. You know, what do you think? is the single biggest skill that you've learned through these seven companies that every entrepreneur should learn? That's an easy one. I learned it from the very beginning at 23. I had some great mentors. And all I have to say, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need <laughs> great people. And if you don't have great people, you'll never have a great company. I had a dream on this one. I came out of retirement to start this so that I could make my friends, who are my friends, I'm working with them every day, over four, you know, almost 500 people. It's amazing to work with them, but it's also gratifying to see them all working together and growing together. And they're very smart and I could never have done this. It was a dream. It would have been a daydream if I didn't have people come work with me <laughs> and it never would have became reality. I love that. So, Dave, I, I saw in your history you have experience with compliance, of course, and HIPAA compliance, which is a big healthcare. You know, if, if people don't know, you, everybody's heard that term. But there's so many compliance issues across so many industries. You know, OSHA for warehousing, HIPAA for health. You know, whether you're getting into government work, and in the world that you're in, I don't want names. You're a publicly traded company, but I would like to know what is the largest horror story or what you can think of where you walked into something that you said, oh my gosh, this place is not compliant and they're taking care of all of this, either data or, or health information. Have you run into those scenarios where you could not believe? Now, you might've been brought in to solve it, but sometimes the extreme nature of how uncompliant some areas that should be are not. I'll give you two quick rapid ones. <laughs> One client uh, did a proposal and said right off the bat, CEO, you need to change your password being compliance because you have billions of dollars in intellectual property. And he goes, no, everybody else changes it except I won't. And I said, I'm done. And I got up and walked away. And nine months later, they were breached. Was Just it was it password one, two, three? Was it something that simple? <laughs> it was that simple. Okay, and fair. And the next one was, is we got into a situation where the company didn't disclose. There were two other incumbents there and we're kind of the wild west gunslingers. We get called in. We found it within 20 minutes. Well, they'd been working on it 48 hours. And so we were able to go into the hackers site, which most people couldn't find. We parsed it out and we started seeing files that had DOD, DTAR, uh, and I had to call the CEO and go, you didn't tell us you're a military contractor. In fact, it's classified documents my people can't. <laughs> oh and my I gosh. Point. And I'm like, they're like, how did you know? I go, that's what they exfiltrated. Wow. Wow. Very uncomfortable conversation with the executive level. You know, th Amazing. this past um, two weeks, we basically have seen two huge companies. I think it was BlockFi today and uh, FTX and the crypto world basically go uh, belly up. Do you think ultimately being in this world of cybersecurity that will end up with, with a digital dollar? Or do you think this has probably spooked everybody out? Well, people always ask me about Bitcoin. And I said, who are you going to call if you lose your money? Nobody. No one. <laughs> no. I, uh, until it becomes regulated, I mean, banks right now, the large banks are working on digital currency because that is going to be the future. It's how do you secure it? And it's got to be regulated so it can, can take care of everyone. Um, I have a great friend I've known. He bragged he bought a thousand Bitcoin at $200 and he lost his key. His computer crashed and he never put it on the thumb drive. Uh, so, wow. Who is he going to call to get it back? I don't know. Nobody. So true. But it's a great, it's a great way to have currency and it'll go through healthcare, um, you know, uh, blockchain that will have our right. blockchain, our healthcare information, but in absolutely mainstream, I would step a little farther away from it. All right, Ted, I got two. I'm going to hit David with two ones. Cause I know I want to know this. And I'm sure our listeners do. David, what, what kind of cell phone do you use? Do you use a droid or an Apple? Droid. Droid. Okay, fair. That makes sense, actually. A lot more control. 
Uh, I have been screaming, uh, and I have a little experience in the technology world, but I've been screaming to clients for many, many years, and even to my partner here, Ted, what is your, I'm sure, and I'm hoping you use a password manager. What is your password manager of choice? Um, well, we've chosen Bitdefender for our phones as well as our password manager. Okay, fair. But you, you hesitated on that answer. Um, I don't like to give product endorsements, but, you know, quite frankly, okay. uh, I've had very good success with both products. So it's, I mean, that product, including the password manager, it's kind of hard to have hundreds of things you log into all the time. You want to make sure they're safe. So David, I'll say this to take you off the hook because I focused on your agnostic nature of your company, which is most important. The fact that you're using one is what makes me happy. And the reality is I will promote not Bitdefender, LastPass or OnePass or any of them. I will promote, just make sure you use one, if you would agree. I 100% agree and make sure they're secure. Precisely. Well, um, this, is, uh, this is pretty fantastic stuff. I mean, always awesome to talk to CEOs of publicly traded companies. For everybody who is watching today, go check out the ticker symbol CISO. David, I always tell all of our guests that are CEOs of publicly traded uh, companies, once we do the show, I got to buy some of your stock just so I just so I got some interest in it uh, overall. And uh, uh, I just hope you have continued success. Where can people learn more about the company and more about you uh, as if they want to follow up after the podcast? Uh, Cerberus, the three headed dog. And the reason we have it, three C's of cyber sentinel, just like standing, you know, alert dot com. That's where our website is. And so I'll leave you with something that will perplex you and your audience. 2021, how much was stolen or attributed to cybersecurity loss in 2021? Sure. 6.5 trillion. Do you know how much <laughs> the world in cyber? 187 billion. By 2025, it'll be 10.5 trillion is what Forrester Gartner are estimating. So cybersecurity Security is real. Cyber crime is paying people very well, and it's going to continue. So be on the lookout and make sure you do what you can to get yourself more secure. Or, David, if I may, because I might be in the wrong industry, become a hacker and you can take some of that money. Uh, you better not be in the United States because we'll come get you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know. I'm completely joking. That, that's Think of the other direction. Sorry, Ted. Go ahead. No, no. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today, uh, The Shrimp Tank. Everybody make sure that you go watch the entire broadcast if you uh, uh, shrimptankpodcast.com. Go on our YouTube channel, or as I mentioned, just download us at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, or Spotify. This is uh, great stuff today. We tell all of our business owners, listen, there are a lot of things you got to have in your business. And now cybersecurity, this is not a, a, a nice to do. It's a must do in your business. Um, go check out Cerberus Sentinel. Uh, and thanks, David, so much for your time today. Continued success to the company. Thank you so much. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.